I want to welcome you back to our series on reconsidering the upside down kingdom. We continue in the mystical gospel of John and we're focusing on Jesus basically turning the whole world upside down. That's been our focus and that continues to be our focus up to the day in which we celebrate Jesus turning upside down life and death itself. Eternity itself with Easter. But we're moving closer and closer to it. Moving all the time towards that hill. And yet waiting from time to time. And watching how Jesus turns lives upside down. If you were here, you remember the first week. He flipped our image of what? Of who? Upside down? God. First, and I'm going to give you a little grace, because it is only 10 o'clock in your bodies. So you'll give a little bit of grace. But then last week, Jesus flipped over something else. First week was our image of God. This last week was what? Religion. And today, something new, which is embedded in your point. If you would like to read it together, I think I need to have you read it with me just to make sure that you are still with it. So here we go, right underneath Wonder Water Woman, John 4, 5 and 42, you'll see a point. Let's read it together. Jesus turns prejudice upside down. Not down. But what kind? Oh, I'm so glad that you asked. You see, today in Jesus' text, in, in this text, Jesus turns six different kinds of prejudice upside down. Now, the great part is, all six of these prejudices are still alive and well today. Not only outside the church, but inside the church. And so it's very relevant that we address these prejudices through the lens of the gospel today. It is as relevant as it was on that hot, dusty day in Samaria so long ago. Please follow along as I read. I don't want to mess you up. But I am starting in the middle of the section uh, in verse 5. I'm sorry. Yeah, let's go to verse 5. It said, I know it says on your outline verse 4, doesn't it? Let's start on verse 5. See, I'm checking you already. It's early. We're messing around. Did you get there? We're in chapter 4, verse 5. Just make a light snoring sound. Yes. Thanks. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. On your outline, if you wish, what kind of 
prejudice does Jesus address initially? It is the prejudice of racism and sexism. Racism and sexism. Now, before we dive too deep, let me just let me just help you out because maybe you're like me and you got stuck in the verse already. No, what, what time is it? It's the sixth hour on the Jewish day, and I'm way back in verse six. Let's just understand. The Jewish day ran from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Okay? That was the Jewish day. So when is the sixth hour? Definitely. High noon. High noon. We're in the heat of the day. You'll see that is significant. So let's talk about the racism that raged in Jesus' day. Jews hated Samaritans for around 400 years. Why? There are a number of reasons why Jews hated Samaritans. One was the Samaritan held that the first five books of the Bible were it. There was no more to it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's their Bible. They, they would take no more. No Isaiah, no Proverbs, no Psalms. And so they did not, they did not observe the same scripture that the Jew did. They also held, as was touched on, they believed that Mount Gerizim was holier than Jerusalem. Go to a Jew and tell them any place on earth is holier than Jerusalem. You'll have a fight on your hands. Because to the Jew, Jerusalem is it. Mount Moriah is the place. They said no. Our ancestors say Jerusalem. But the thing that really was the center of the conflict was the reality that 400 years before, during an exile, the people who stayed in that region intermarried. They mixed races. And so they could no longer be called the pure Jewish line. They had mixed races with those who were planted with the exile. And so they were hated. They may have looked different. They may have spoken a different dialect or lived and worshipped in different places. And thus barriers of prejudice went up. And over the years, those barriers got thicker and taller and stronger. Jesus engages a Samaritan in a conversation about God. that starts with a simple request for a common need to prove a powerful point I'm thirsty. You're thirsty. We're both human. I'm not better than you. You are not better than me. In fact, can you help me? We're both on the same level when we come to the well. But let's leave that for just a moment to address the other ism. Let's understand very clearly. Rabbis of which Jesus was and was constantly referred to as rabbi. Rabbis did not address women in public. And I don't just mean women. A rabbi would not address his daughter, would not address his sister, and not even his wife in public. A rabbi would not speak to you if you are a woman. There were rabbis a sect known as the bruised and the bleeding. They were a sect of rabbis that if they saw a woman coming down the road in public, they would close their eyes and they would keep walking. Thus they would bang their head into things and fall over things. They were known as the bruised and the bleeding. If you were a woman, they wouldn't even look at you. <clears throat> and what did this man do? He spoke to her. He spoke to this woman who was a stranger. Jesus turns over a profound sexism that suddenly validates this woman's life and later will validate her spirituality. But for now, let's just apply where we're at. I need to ask you, how has racism affected or infected your life. I remember one of the most profound situations I was ever in in regards to a racist thing was when I was in 
uh, Italy. I, I, I met this guy uh, from South Africa. His name was Peter. And we rode the train together. We had a great time. I, I spoke enough Dutch that I could understand him. And, and then we switched to English. And it was a great time. And he was this big, burly guy. I found out he was a South African policeman. And this was still in the time of apartheid. And we, we, we arrived at this uh, little Italian town called Sicily on a hot rock known as Palermo. And on Palermo, I should say Sicily, Palermo is in Sicily. It's closer to Africa than it is Italy, culturally. And as we walked down the street, I saw, I saw some, some black vendors on, on the street, and we were walking towards them. And I'm talking to Peter, and then all of a sudden I realized Peter's not with me. <laughs> Peter's crossed the road. You wouldn't even walk on the same side of the street as these African vendors. And then as we passed the booths, I, I bought some stuff. And he, he just kept walking. And then when we got past him, he, he came back over to me. And I said, Peter. What's going on? He said, you know the black? The black is not human. I said, what? He said, you just don't understand. I said, oh, but I think I do. Racism is real for many people. <coughs> is it for you? Do you let a person's race or ethnicity determine your opinion of them? There is only one race. We are all sons and daughters of Eve and Adam. We are all sons and daughters of Noah. I would throw in one plug for a, for a Ken Ham video on racism. Absolutely unbelievable and undeniable that we are one race. It's the human race. How has sexism affected or infected your life? And friends, I was in the marching band where I was the male minority. I have worked in offices where I was the male minority. I know that, folks, I'm sorry, but women can be just as, as nasty as, as men. I don't need your amen. <laughs> Are you prone to judge a person by their sex? My six-year-old came to me the other day and said, Daddy, what sex? It's the difference between a boy and a girl. Okay? Your sex. When I say, does your opinion of someone... Are you judged? Do you judge people by their sex? Do you routinely think or say things like, that's so typical of a... <laughs> or maybe if we back it up to racism. You know, he's just a, they're all like that. Now I know, you are good politically correct Mennonites, so you might never say that out loud, but do you think that? <laughs> Perhaps racism and sexism has infected you, but oh, let's keep going. Because there's more prejudice Jesus wants to flip out of our life. Verses 16 through 26. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. In fact, I'm sorry, verse 18, the fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship 
what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet the time is coming and now come and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth, the woman said. I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I will speak to you and he. What kind of prejudice are we talking about? May I suggest that we're also talking about personal and theistic prejudice. Uh, personal, you know, is about you. Theistic is just a $2 seminary word for oriented towards God. Okay, theistic, theology, theistic prejudices. <coughs> Suddenly Jesus goes to the next level. We see the spiritual surgeon operating and cutting to the bone of sin and self. Once we get past the other prejudices, we have to face ourselves, don't we? We have to face ourselves and we have to face God Almighty. Jesus holds up a mirror to the woman. A mirror with such shocking clarity. And says, do you like what you see? Here's some truth. Can you even see yourself without your own prejudice against yourself? Many people I know that hate others are just actually reflecting the self-hatred that embitters them from the very core of their being. How can I love others if I hate myself? So then she reveals her true struggle, which I believe is everyone's true struggle. Okay, how, how do I get to God? How do I get to God? All the religious people say different things. I'm confused. Where can I go to get to God? Jesus explains it's not about a place. It's about a people. Or, or maybe it's even about a person and about a perspective that you bring when you seek God. Jesus says very clearly that two things are available to everyone, the spirit and the truth. That's what everyone truly thirsts for. That's what I've come to give. This is what Jesus says. Application. Are you prejudiced against yourself? Are you prejudiced against yourself? Is the person you despise most in the mirror looking back at you in the morning? Why did the Samaritan woman come at high noon in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, because she did not want to see anyone else. All the other women came earlier in the day or later in the evening. But she did not want to have a reflection to see herself in. And those other women may have reflected what she did not want to see. So she went when she thought no one would be there. Do you hide because you know you're so bad? Do you hide from friends and family? Jesus still wants to talk to you. In fact, Jesus may want to remind you of the greatest commandment, which was so wonderfully put. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbor as your self. Mmm, it's hard. These Mennonites were so good at going across the pond, loving those out there. We struggle a little bit more when we start loving those in here, maybe. But then what if? Mm, are you prejudiced? 
against yourself? Are you prejudiced against God? Has religion and religious leaders and learning so messed up your view of God that you're confused to the point of saying, you know what, I don't even know where I can find this God. I don't know if he's real. But what I've heard, I don't even know if I have the time. Never miss that last verse when Jesus says, I'm him. I'm the one. Jesus came to totally flip our prejudice of God because He's here and He loves us. Will you give up your prejudice of God Himself? I had a person once say to me, you know, I just, I can't accept Jesus as my Savior and Lord because I don't trust Him. I don't trust Him because he was a man, and I don't trust men. What have you projected on God that is keeping you from getting close to Him? May I suggest that it's a prejudice that Jesus has come to break down, to flip over. Finally, verses 27 through 30, and I know it's still early, I'm going to mess you up. We're going to go 27 through 30, then I'm going to hop down to 39 through 42. Okay. I'll let you know when it comes. Verse 27. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking to her? Then leaving the water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come See a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of town and made their way towards him. We're going to go down to 39. Stay with me. Stay with me. Verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So... When the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with him. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Hallelujah. What kind of prejudices? May I suggest this morning, Jesus even addresses our political and geographic prejudices. The disciples were hushed by the peace that had been made. It was awe-inspiring to see the prejudice crumble before their eyes. No verse 28. This is so significant, and I love the image. If you can just flip back on your other screen in your head and get that image of that jug being washed by water that Brenda and Jeff uh, so marvelously gave us. Hold that image in that other screen in your brain. She left her jar. Why? Because she was full to overflowing. There's water that was washing over her. Wow, fabulous. Um, she got what she came for, even though it wasn't what she was looking for. She got it anyway. Jesus built a bridge with this woman. I would believe it to be shaky at best. The witness of this woman, Jesus paid this woman to be his missionary. Whoa. Surprise, surprise. But still, the Spirit went with her. Truth went with her. And so we see people crossing a political bridge. Barriers. We don't associate with those people because they're different. But the people came. And now they come to a Jewish teacher. No religious political banter because Jesus removes the banter and he removes the barrier and the people come crossing over. But then he goes even further. Jesus shatters the geographic barrier and stayed with these people 
two days. A Jew would not even go into their house. He would not even use the cup that a Samaritan would use. He would have to throw it away if a Samaritan would use it. He stayed two days. This drive-through zone only became a place of welcome where he stayed. This despised race blows open the doors of the kingdom with verse 42 because they saw Jesus for who he was, not the Savior of Jerusalem, not the Savior of, Jeru of Judaism, but rather the Savior of the world, application. Uh, this is an election year. Did anyone notice? None at all? Two people. Good. Um, political lines are being drawn. I'm sure very soon we will live in a country of red and blue states again. I want you to understand that I personally engage and enjoy our process. I think it's wonderful. Until I see it dividing the kingdom. Beyond our political and geographic boundaries, can we agree that Jesus is the Savior of our world? And can we testify that Jesus is our personal Savior and from that perspective discern together how we make decisions? I believe we should prayerfully discern every issue together and not in separate camps. May I ask, are you letting political or geographic prejudices get in the way of the kingdom? Are you letting political and geographic prejudices get in the way of the work and the loving that needs to happen now more than ever? I'd like to pray today with you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the witness of Scripture. I thank you that Jesus came to turn over the prejudices that it almost seems that we are born with. Oh, we are so prone to cluster. But I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you, you cross the barriers, you cross the boundaries. And you acknowledge that we are people thirsty. I thank you so much that you give your spirit and your truth. I pray that in a time that prejudices are played upon so heavily that those prejudices will not infect or affect our church. <coughs> Lord, help us to acknowledge, as those Samaritans did so long ago, that you are our, our Lord and Savior. And help us to reach across and welcome those who may be a different race, may be the opposite sex. But Lord, help us also to reach into ourselves and find that beautiful soul that you have created. Lord, help us need to love ourselves. But Lord, in the end, help us to love you. Help us above all else and all other allegiances to proclaim you as Lord and Savior of the world. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name we ask all of this. Amen.